We have four panelists today joining us. Each panelist will provide a short briefing. Then we will move to the question and answer session, accepting questions from media that dialed into the phone bridge and those that submitted questions via Twitter using the hashtag AskNASA. There will also be a Reddit Ask Me Anything on NASA's moon exploration plans at 1 p.m. Eastern tomorrow on the space subreddit. This media telecon will be limited to one hour. Today's panelists are Paul Hertz, Astrophysics Division Director at NASA Headquarters in Washington. Jacob Bleacher, Chief Exploration Scientist for the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA Headquarters. Casey Hanabal, Postdoctoral Fellow at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Nassim Rangwala, Project Scientist for the SOFIA mission and NASA Ames Research Center, Silicon Valley, California. We also have a special guest today, Sarah Noble, Lunar Scientist at NASA Headquarters. And with that, let's get started. Paul? Thank you, Felicia. Um, uh, it's great to be uh, making this announcement today. Several studies have showed that water on the moon's surface is in its permanently shadowed craters. Today, we are announcing that for the first time, water has been confirmed to be present on a sunlit surface of the moon. This is exciting because the expectation is that any water present on a sunlit surface of the moon would not survive the lunar day. This discovery reveals that water might be distributed across the lunar surface and not limited to the cold shadowed places near the lunar poles where we have previously discovered water ice. The discovery was made with SOFIA, NASA's Airborne Observatory, which flies a 100-inch or 2.5-meter telescope high in the Earth's atmosphere to study the universe in the far infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. The water molecule consists of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Sometimes water is called H2O. Previous observations detected hydrogen through hydration on the lunar surface. SOFIA's infrared spectrometer was able to identify the chemical fingerprint unique to the water molecule, showing that the previously detected hydrogen is in a water molecule and not in some other kind of hydrogen-containing molecule. This discovery raises new questions about how water is created and how it can persist in the harsh, airless conditions of the sunlit lunar surface. This discovery, of course, is of more than just scientific interest to NASA. With the Artemis program, NASA will land the first woman and the next man on the moon in 2024 and establish a sustainable human presence by the end of the decade. At the moon, we will prepare for human exploration of Mars. Water is a precious resource in space. But we want to know everything we can about water on the moon. One of the things we don't know yet is whether the water detected by SOFIA on a sunlit surface is accessible for use as a resource. With that introduction, I'm now going to turn it over to Casey Hannibal, who is the lead author of the paper published today reporting this discovery. Casey? Thank you, Paul. So prior to this discovery, for about a decade, we knew that there was some form of hydrogen on the sunlit surface of the moon based on previous spectroscopic observations. Spacecraft studied the moon in the infrared at wavelengths of three microns and could not differentiate between the water molecules and their close cousin hydroxyl. Hydroxyl is actually the active ingredient in drain cleaners. Hypothetically, if drain cleaner were on the moon, we could not tell the difference between the drain cleaner and water using the three micron wavelength. However, if we study the lunar surface at a wavelength of six microns with SOFIA, the water molecule has a distinct chemical fingerprint that hydroxyl does not have. The six micron fingerprint requires the bond between two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom that only exists in the water molecule H2O. SOFIA's unique position above most of the water in the Earth's atmosphere allowed us to look for the six micron fingerprint on the sunlit moon. This observation finally allowed us to definitively determine that water molecules are present on the sunless surface of the moon. We found the water in the moon's southern hemisphere at Clavius Crater and its surrounding region. Clavius is one of the largest craters visible from Earth. 
At this location, the data reveal a water concentration of about 100 to 400 parts per million. That's roughly equivalent to a 12 ounce bottle of water within a cubic meter of volume of lunar soil. But our observations with Sophia only sense the very surface of the moon. To be clear, this is not puddles of water, but instead water molecules that are so spread apart that they do not form ice or liquid water. The water that we observe has two potential sources. It could be either from the solar wind or micrometeorites. The solar wind delivers hydrogen to the lunar surface that reacts with oxygen in the soil and forms hydroxyl. During micrometeorite impacts on the moon, this pre-existing hydroxyl can be converted into water by con combining two hydroxyl molecules together in the high temperatures from the impact. Many of these same micrometeorites may also contain water of their own that can transfer to the moon. What's interesting is that without a thick lunar atmosphere, water on any hot sunlit surface of the moon should be lost to space or find its way to the lunar polar cold trap. Yet somehow we're still seeing it on the sunlit moon. We think the water is trapped within glass beads within the soil that forms during the micrometeorite impact. These glass beads are about the size of a pencil tip and protect the water from the harsh lunar environment. Understanding the source of water and its retention helps piece together the broader history and role water plays in the inner solar system and on other airless bodies like asteroids and may have implications for human exploration. Our next speaker is Jacob Bleacher. Jacob. Thank you, Casey. Uh, the SOFIA results discussed today are very exciting for us in human exploration. This discovery is a great example of science and human exploration working hand in hand. This is a multidiscipline science approach to collect data that will also help enable human exploration. Understanding where the water is on the moon will help us prepare to send astronauts to the lunar south pole with our Artemis program. But you might ask, why does water matter to Artemis? Well, it's far easier to travel when you don't have to carry everything with you that you might need for the entire trip. For instance, here on Earth, if you can depend on resources throughout your trip and at your destination, uh, things you might get at a gas station or a restaurant or hotels or campsites, then you can be much more efficient with what you pack. If it comes down to packing water or your favorite book to read, well, you'll have to take the water to survive. <clears throat> water is extremely critical for deep space exploration. It's a resource of direct value for our astronauts. Water can be turned into oxygen for them to breathe. It could be a fuel supply that they use later. Uh, but obviously, it can be water they can drink, or you could use it for other purposes. But water is heavy, and therefore, it's expensive to launch from the surface of the Earth. Anytime we don't need to pack water for our trip, we have an opportunity to take other useful items with us. For instance, payloads to do more science. So you can imagine easily... Being able to use water that is already at the moon would be a big help for us in exploring the moon with our astronauts. We know there's water at the moon, but we don't know exactly how accessible lunar water is for our future explorers. Knowing where we can find water is a good first step, but we need to know more about the water to understand if and how we can use it for both science and exploration. We know that water exists in some of the darkest and coldest locations on the moon, inside craters that have never seen sunlight. Those cold and dark environments are difficult to reach, and they can be even harder to work in for long periods of time. So finding water that's easier to reach um, is really important to us. This could involve finding easier to reach small craters that have the water, or as these Sophia results show, that we can find water outside of these craters. Understanding the state in which the water exists is quite important. If it's locked into the glass beads, as Casey mentioned, it may require more energy to extract it. If the water's mixed up in the soil, it might be a little easier. Regardless, knowing more about that water, how it gets there, the form in which it's present, how much of it exists, whether it moves around, all of this is very useful information for planning possible resource utilization on the moon. It's also important to understand how stable the water is and how easily disturbed or lost it might be, as well as whether or not it might be replenished over time or if it's lost for good from the location once we sample or use it. Future missions like NASA's Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, or VIPER, 
will be looking for water directly on the surface and up to a meter below the surface uh, to help make the first water resource maps of the moon. You can see that this exciting discovery leads to many new questions about water on the moon and our future science and exploration activities. And now we'll hear from Nassim Rangwala, Sophia's project scientist. Thanks, Jacob. As Paul mentioned, Sophia is an airborne observatory. By flying at high altitudes, up to 45,000 feet, Sophia is able to get above 99.9% .9 of the water vapor in Earth's atmosphere that is blocking the infrared light from space. Specifically for this discovery, Sophia allowed us to detect water on the sunlit surface of the moon without contamination from terrestrial water. Sophia carries an instrument that is able to pick up the specific wavelength unique to water molecules at 6.1 microns, as you heard from Casey. In fact, Sophia is currently the only telescope on or off this world that can provide remote access to this unique chemical fingerprint of water at 6.1 microns. Normally, uh, we study distant and uh, much dimmer objects like black holes, star clusters, and galaxies. This was actually the first time Sophia observed the moon, and we did it as a test case. Because the questions surrounding the moon's water were so compelling, we decided to use the observatory in a way not previously imagined. So in August of 2018, we decided to try a test observation on the moon. Uh, this discovery was made while we were flying over Nevada on our way back to our home base in Palmdale, California. What was essentially a test far exceeded our expectations. Now that we know we can do this, and given the importance of understanding the distribution of water on the moon and the origin of water in our solar system, we are planning more flights with SOFIA to collect more data. We are very excited that these follow-up observations will look for water in more sunlit locations to better understand how water is created, stored, and moves across the lunar surface over time. These observations will add to the data that NASA's next moon rover, the Wiper mission, will collect to create the first water resource maps of the moon. Back to you, Paul. Thanks, Nassim. NASA's space observatories allow us to study the universe in ways that are impossible from the ground. And although SOFIA is not a space observatory, it's an airborne observatory, it does allow us a view of the universe in the far infrared that is impossible from the ground because the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere blocks this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Today, we are announcing an important discovery by SOFIA that the previously detected hydrogen on the sunlit surface of the moon is located in water molecules. This discovery raises new questions about how water is created on the surface of the moon and how it can persist in the harsh, airless, sunlit conditions of the lunar surface. Knowing how much water is on the moon and how we might be able to use it in the future supports NASA's long-term human exploration goals into deep space. NASA will continue to leverage all of its assets including SOFIA, the world's premier airborne observatory, to contribute to the success of the Artemis mission and NASA's human exploration program. Alicia? Thanks, Paul. Media resources for this announcement is available on nasa.gov slash SOFIA and can also be found on our press release. We will now start the question and answer session. Sarah Noble, Headquarter Lunar Scientist, will also be joining us to cover your questions. We will limit everyone to one question. Our operator should identify you, but if not, please identify yourself, your media affiliation, and then direct your question to a specific panelist if possible. For those dialing in, push star one keys on your phone to be placed into queue. To ask a question using Twitter, please use the hashtag AskNASA. And with that, let's begin. Let's start with Jeff Faust from Space News. to the moon, whether they are orbiters or some of the, the landers beyond, obviously, the Viper rover, might be used to better characterize 
um, the water signal that you saw with Sophia. Is there anything currently on the books that would help in that regard? Thanks. This is Jake. I'm sorry, we missed the very beginning of your question. Um, could you maybe restate it, please? Sure. Let me let me try and summarize. Uh, are any of the upcoming missions, whether they are orbiters or landers, including payloads on clips landers, uh, useful in helping to better characterize the water signal you saw with Sophia? Thanks. Yeah, I can uh, I can give you a little background on on some additional clips capabilities that we're looking at. Uh, the, the CLIPS flights or commercial lunar payload services uh, will leverage capabilities of industry partners uh, to quickly deliver scientific instruments, technology demonstrations to the moon. Um, as part of that, uh, NASA will be sending dozens of science investigations and technology experiments to the surface uh, that will help us find and potentially extract uh, later resources on the moon. Uh, so just an example of some of these uh, that we're looking at moving forward. Um, one would be the mass spectrometer observing observing lunar operations, or MSOLO. MSOLO will identify low molecular weight volatiles. Uh, it can be installed to either measure the lunar exosphere or even things like spacecraft outgassing and contamination, because we also want to understand what our presence might be doing to the uh, the water and the uh, the precious volatiles there. Uh, so data gathered from MSOLO will help determine the composition and concentration of these potentially accessible resources. Another example would be a neutron spectrometer system, NSS. Uh, NSS will search for indications of water, ice near the lunar surface uh, by measuring how much hydrogen-bearing materials are at a landing site and help determine the overall bulk composition of the regolith around it. Uh, another example would be the near-infrared volatile spectrometer, uh, or NERVIS. NERVIS will measure surface and subsurface hydration, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, all resources that could potentially be mined uh, from the moon and used uh, by our future explorers. Uh, they also help map uh, surface temperature changes at the landing site. Uh, and we mentioned uh, we mentioned Viper earlier. Um, we also have another activity uh, that will be going ahead of Viper. Um, NASA has awarded Eclipse provider uh, Intuitive Machines a task order to fly the Polar Resources Ice Mining Experiment, or Prime One. Uh, so Prime One is a drill combined with a mass spectrometer, and will be heading to the moon um, late 2022. Uh, so this is a precursor uh, drill. Um, and it will fly with Viper, um, um, which will fly. Um, uh, it is a precursor to the Trident drill that's going to fly with M Solo on Viper. Uh, so this is going to give us an example of uh, how exactly to use the more uh, enabled Viper mission when we get it there. So we do have a series of activities and payloads that are already set up to help us start measuring this and understand more about the uh, the environment and the volatiles there. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is Marsha Dunn from AP. Oh, sorry. Yes, Marsha Dunn from AP. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Um, yes, this is for um, the lead author, um, Ms. Hannibal. Uh, could you tell me, please, um, how much, you know, over how much area of the moon did you um, detect these molecules, these what are molecules? I'm, if you could give some sense of um, how vast an area, how small an area, and how many molecules are we actually talking about in the thousands, millions? I'm, I'm just trying to get a, a handle on how big and how much. Thank you. Yeah, so the Clavius crater is the largest crater observed from the Earth, but it's not, uh, it's not that big. When we looked at the moon, our observations extended from about a, a 65, or sorry, a 50 degree latitude down to about 75 degrees in latitude on the moon. So we only covered a few degrees um, on the moon. What also, the abundances that we measured are only 100 to 400 ppm of water, which is not a lot. Like I said, these water molecules are not interacting with each other. They are individual molecules incorporated into these glass beads, so they're not in a form of ice or liquid.
Thank you. Next question. We have David Curley from the Discovery Channel. Thanks for uh, taking the question. Um, you kind of touched on it there. I mean, this is an amazing discovery, but how much is there? Uh, will it matter? Will it provide for astronauts if uh, we need to mine it? Thank you. Casey, I think um, maybe you could reiterate the uh, amount of water. Yeah, so the amount of water is um, roughly equivalent to a 12-ounce bottle of water within a cubic meter of lunar soil. But this, instead of being at a volume, this is spread across the surface of the moon. Um, whether or not it's usable for mining, I will turn over to Jacob. Yeah, thanks, Casey. That's and and this is you know this is the the core part to the question, right? And I think several of us hinted at this is that we really need to understand more about the water that's present. Um, so we we need to understand what form it's in. Uh, we need to understand how much of it there is, and the, this complement of uh, approaches of measurements that we can make. Um, some of them look at just at the surface. Some can look deeper uh, below the surface. Uh, some see water in different forms than in other forms. We need to gain that broad picture of what the resource stock really is at the South Polar region. We also need to understand how we can not only approach it as a resource, but how we can also use it as a science resource, because that ice also carries with it um, much information about evolution of the solar system, evolution of the sun, evolution of the moon earth system. Uh, so, you know, it, it's hard to answer the question straight up. Is this discovery going to provide us with enough water to do anything specific? It's part of a process in moving forward and understanding volatiles and volatile cycles on the moon. And this is an important discovery because now we know that that water does exist outside of some of these places in these dark craters that are really hard to get into and really hard to operate in. So this might be an avenue for us to, uh, to get to water a little bit easier. Thank you. Next, I believe we have Joey Roulette from Reuters. Hey, a uh, question for Paul and Jacob, um, kind of similar to what was asked before, but what will it take to know whether the water molecules can be turned into usable resources to support um, the Artemis program, like you know, drinkable water, ingredients for rocket fuel, et cetera? Um, do you think we'll know this from more re remote observations, or will we have to rely on future you know, robots or probes on the ground on the moon? Thanks. Well, I can give my, uh, my first shot at answering that question. Um, you know, we already listed off um, a handful of, of additional payloads that are uh, planned to go to the lunar surface. I think it's critical uh, that we combine remote observation, which can give us the broad context. So, you know, observations from, from SOFIA coupled with other uh, observations that look more broadly at the moon can tell us regionally where we see those signatures. But then we need to also get on the ground uh, and sample. So we have, as I mentioned, the um, Viper mission is heading that way. And, I, you know, I hope that you can see that this is kind of an iterative approach. So, for instance, we're sending the Prime 1 drill to help us understand better how to approach it when we get Viper there that's a more capable vehicle. Um, so, you know, answering the question exactly when we'll know is difficult. What I can say is that from a uh, in-situ resource utilization perspective, uh, you know, we have multiple approaches to extracting the water, um, multiple activities that are underway. And as we learn more, we'll know better which of those to develop further so that we can follow that approach. And it may be that there's multiple approaches uh, because the water may be in different forms in different places. It may be more accessible. Uh, we also, again, have to learn um, just simply going up to the water. Are we going to be disruptive to it to the point that we then can't use it? Uh, so, you know, each one of these lessons helps us learn better how to query uh, the lunar environment, the lunar surface on our next step uh, moving forward. Thank you. Next, we have Kenneth Chang from the New York Times. Kenneth? Uh, 
Hello, Dennis, are you on? Okay, before we go back to Kenneth, um, let's go ahead and take some Ask NASA questions. If you would like to ask a question using Twitter, please use the hashtag AskNASA. So we have a question from Liam Parker asking, what volume of water is found and does it suggest life may have been present on the moon previously? Sarah, can you uh, talk about that? Sure. So we covered a little bit about how much water is there. It's not a lot. Uh, and it's also water by itself is really not enough. There are other ingredients necessary uh, for life. And the, the moon is, frankly, a really harsh place. The radiation environment, the lack of an atmosphere, um, there are lots of reasons we can talk about that where, where life is just not uh, a thing that we think could have ever been possible. Thank you. Let's try to jump back to the Q&A. Dennis, are you available? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, so I just wanted to clarify a few things. Uh, in 2009, there was data from Chanjiao uh, one about water in the sunlit area. Is this a confirmation of that, confirming that it's water and not hydroxyl, but otherwise similar? And was there a confirmation of water in the deep craters from the L cross, or is there also that ambiguity between H2O and hydroxyl? Hi, this is Katie. Well, so I can take the first part of that. The observations from 2009 with M cube on the lunar surface were of the three micron band, which could not distinguish between hydroxyl and water molecules. What our detection today on the summit moon is saying is that at least part of what M cube detected is in the form of molecular water. Um, maybe somebody else can take the L cross part. Sure. Let me let me jump in. We L cross did in fact find find water, uh, but that was of course looking in a permanently shadowed region. Uh, so the difference here is that that we're now seeing it in sunlight as well. Great, thank you. Next, we have Christopher Kavgians from Sky News Canada. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, and it's Coquino, so it's an odd name, <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, first, congratulations to the team. Um, and then a, a question about the, the map, the water map uh, of Clavius. Um, and did you see any evidence of movement of these molecules over time? In other words, these apparent glass beads that are containing these stray water molecules, are they breaking down? Are they moving at all uh, due to solar wind or micrometeorite impacts? So was this, do you see, do you see a process? Is the map dynamic at all? Or, or is that something to look for in future missions? This is Casey. Yeah, that is definitely something that we are going to be looking for uh, moving forward with continuing observations with SOFIA. With the current data, it's just a snapshot in time of one location at one time on the moon. So we need, in order to understand the mobility of water and if it's moving and how it's really stored, we need more observations of different lunar phases to really be able to get at that mobility problem of water. Yeah, thank you. Next, we have Leo Enright from Irish TV. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm wondering about this, the source of this water. You mentioned one possibility as glass beads on the surface being impacted uh, by the solar wind. Now, I'm afraid my, I'm showing my age with this question, but I was actually in the science support room in the Mission Control Center uh, during Apollo 17 when they were at Shorty Crater. Uh, and I will never forget the scenes in that room when they found orange soil because everybody in the room believed that that meant water, and they were devastated, many of them, though they're scientists, when they discovered, well, maybe it wasn't. Um, I'm wondering, could, could those be exactly the beads that you're talking about? Hi, this is Casey. So those are actually different kinds of beads. Those are volcanic beads that were erupted during uh, a volcanic process on the moon. The, Beads that, the glass beads that we're talking about are little beads that form when a micrometeorite impacts the moon and melts part of the lunar surface. It melts it and, and could either deliver the water or form water from pre-existing hydroxyl. 
which then cools to form a little, what we are calling little glass beads. So there's the ones that they found on Apollo and the ones that we're talking about here are different beads. We do think that the Apollo glass, uh, glass beads like Apollo found may concentrate water and hopefully we can do observations of the uh, Apollo 17 site to possibly detect water at that location with SOFIA. And if I may cheat and ask a follow-up, um, I'm particularly interested in the instrument that you were using. It's my understanding that it was uh, designed and built uh, by the Andor Company in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Is that correct? I'm going to pass this one on to Nassim. Hi, um, are you talking about the instrument um, that uh, made this uh, uh, discovery on Sophia? No, that was made. Yes, uh, the CC the CCD uh, device. I understood it was built by Andor. Uh, well, I will have to get that specific information from the project, but the instrument itself was uh, made in the U.S. by a U.S. institution. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will take another question from the phone lines and then go back to ask NASA questions and then jump back to the phone lines. Let's start with uh, Jim Siegel from NASA Tech. Jim, can you hear us? Okay. Uh, while we try to get through with Jim, let's go ahead and try to answer a question from Ask NASA. Um, Based on the data for the near side of the moon, have we any assumptions for the far side? Could we find the same abundance and the same process? Casey, can you cover this question? Yeah, so we believe that on the far side of the moon, the abundances are probably going to be very similar to what we see on the near side of the moon. Uh, we obviously would need more observations to really be able to tell uh, if there's locations that may be different, though. Great. And this one's for Paul Hertz. Will James Webb Space Telescope be useful for confirming and enhancing water detection on the moon? Yeah, thanks, Felicia. Well, it is true that Webb has instruments which cover this six micron wave, uh, wavelength. Uh, however, uh, Webb cannot look in the direction of the Earth, moon, or sun. Its uh, tennis court size sun shield blocks all light and heat from those directions which is how Webb maintains its very, very cold telescope surface. So, no, it cannot look at the moon. Okay, great. Um, here's a question for Sarah from Rev D. With finding water on the surface of the moon, do we expect to find more water at deeper depths of the moon? So that's a great question and one that we need more data on, right? So this instrument can only see the very top surface of the moon. But if we assume that these are in you know, these glass beads we've been talking about, right, they'll get mixed in deeper and deeper into the soil over time, right, as you get more impacts coming in and create new ones. So they'll get buried uh, down to depths of, of, of feet, meters even. Um, and we do expect to find that uh, in various places on the moon. So one of the things we're looking at with the Viper rover, right, which is why it has a drill that reaches down a meter so that we can actually look at different layers as we go down and see where exactly that water is and how well it gets mixed into deeper layers. Thank you. We're going to take one more Ask NASA question and then go back to the phone lines to see if Jim Siegel is available. Um, here's a question for Jacob. Are there going to be robots sent to mine the H2O and further explore the extent of the water quality? Yeah, so that would be one potential option for how we might do this. Um, you know, again, I'll go back to the point that we still have a lot to learn about how we can interact with these deposits on the surface and, in fact, which form we may go after. Um, I, you know, I think an interesting aspect to this result is uh, Casey discussed two possible um, mechanisms for uh, for creating this signature, um, and it may potentially be a little bit of both. Uh, so at some point, we'll need to learn enough so we can start making decisions about is it easier to invest in, in being able to survive the extremely cold environment and go into these, these shadowed regions, or will it be easier to access the type of water that Sophia is detecting right now? Um, and that might require um, uh, different amounts of energy or needing to be able to manipulate large amounts of regolith in order to extract that water. Um, 
I can certainly envision ways that robots might be beneficial in all of those, but all of these are technology investments that we have to think about. And so this is a really good example of how this isn't only the science mission directorate and our human exploration folks, uh, but our space technology mission directorate as well. Uh, we all have to work together as we collect data from the science approaches to understand what technologies we need to develop to getting our astronauts and, uh, and robotically operated assets to the surface to get the job done. Thanks, Jay Jacob. Um, let's check in with Jim Siegel from NASA Tech. Jim, are you on? Okay, let's jump to Keith Cowing from NASA Watch. Okay, I got your question for Jacob Bleacher, since you seem to be the most senior person who might know how decisions will be made here. Up until now, the Artemis program has put forth this sort of persistent mantra about focusing human landings at the lunar south pole due to the potential water resources. And Jim Bridenstine has said, yeah, we're going to land there the first time. Now that it seems that water is a more ubiquitous, pervasive resource, one would think that this polar focus might pivot. Uh, I know you've had a couple of days at most to look at this. Are you now reconsidering landing sites as a result of this discovery? I know they've talked about global lunar access, but it really has been polar, polar, polar. Yes, yeah, that's, a, that's a good point that you bring up. Um, I will note that in uh, discussions we've had about Artemis and going to the South Polar region, uh, right from the beginning of Vice President Pence's uh, saying that we're going to the South Pole, um, water is one of the resources and rationales for going to this location. Uh, the other is that there are locations in the polar regions that have another resource, which is access to light for greater than 50% of the time. Uh, so just like here on Earth, uh, locations on the moon will experience a, a daytime where they see the sunlight and a nighttime where they do not see the sunlight. And if you can take advantage of locations, um, for instance, at the South Pole, I mentioned that there are places where uh, we see no sunlight in some of these deep craters. Conversely, there are locations on top of high ridges or mountainous peaks where we can see sunlight for more than half the amount of time. And that helps us to optimize our systems uh, to take advantage of both the solar power as well as the, uh, the temperature gradient there or temperature uh, inside the sunlight. Um, so, you know, water is one resource on the lunar surface, and we're certainly learning more about it and where it might be accessed. Uh, but it's not the only resource that we need um, that we will most likely use there. So right now, um, the discussions we have are still focused on the South Polar region. There's actually an Ask NASA question that's very similar to this one. Um, I'm going to give this to Sarah. This is from Van Applegate. Will this change plans for Viper landing areas? Yeah, so not at all, right? So Viper is designed to look in permanently shadowed areas, but also to look in areas that have that are less shadowed, areas that get a little bit of sunlight where we think there might be water deeper, and also look in areas of full sunlight so that we can compare all of these different types of of regions uh, in the polar environment and really get at where the water is located. And so this is actually a perfect opportunity for Viper to follow up on these results and, and look at where the water is. Great, next we have Alexandra Witz from Nature Magazine. I'm going to just stay on the same theme. Um, are any of the upcoming uh, rovers or Artemis missions planned to go specifically to or near Clavius? I can I think speak, you. Yep. Yeah, I can speak for the Artemis um, missions themselves uh, that involve astronauts. Uh, we don't have a, um, a final decision on the landing site yet, uh, so we'll need to take all of this information into consideration. Um, and in addition to access to, to volatiles, there are additional science objectives from the Science Mission Directorate. Uh, that will be of interest to us. And so we need to find sites that balance that access to sunlight, the access to water, places that we can safely land uh, to establish our foothold um, on the lunar surface uh, with all the other science and technology objectives. Um, so the, the information we have here will certainly um, influence where we go and the decisions we make. But, um, but, you know, I can't say for certain that an Artemis mission would be going to that location specifically. 
Thank you. Next, we have Kesha Rogers from the Executive Intelligence Review. Yes, hello, thank you, and thank you for taking my question. Okay, so one of my questions was asked, so I'll just uh, ask the question on um, what, what impact will projects and instruments such as the Intuitive Machines Lunar Ice Drill uh, be for helping to extract the water that we found from the moon for use of the Artemis Three or for crewed missions on the moon? So this is more about the extraction and use of the water ice uh, more so than the location of the water on the moon. Uh, would this type of instrument help us to be able to extract the water from the moon? And that can be um, for uh, Paula. Go ahead. Uh, well, this is Jake, and I'll go ahead and just, just jump in on this one. And if anyone else has anything to add, um, feel free. But absolutely, all the data that we collect uh, every time we go to the moon becomes critical information for us to understand how we will conduct uh, future operations. Um, and that, that's what's so exciting about going uh, to a place like the South Polar region where we have not been before, uh, especially when you couple it with exciting observations from Sophia that we're talking about today. Uh, everything new that we learn is valuable in how we develop those operations. And I've already mentioned the collaboration, the collaborative work between our mission directorates to collect the science information and data, develop the technology and make choices about what pathways in the technology development to follow, enabling our astronauts uh, to get to the surface and do the jobs we're asking them to do. Uh, so, so the drill data will absolutely be important to us in understanding you know, not only future missions, but we already talked about how it's of value to the the next mission, Viper, that will will follow up. So, yes, uh, the the data from the the prime drill will be will be critical for us moving forward, as will all of the payloads that are collecting data about the water environment and the uh, the, the surface environment. Thank you. Next, we're going to take some Ask NASA questions. Uh, this is going to Casey. What was the original intention to observe Moon using SOFIA? So as a graduate student at the University of Hawaii, I began studying lunar hydration, looking at the three micron band that couldn't distinguish between hydroxyl and molecular water. And I was always questioning my advisor, Paul Lucy, why is this such a hard problem? Why haven't we, why can't we distinguish between the two? Uh, that led us to down a rabbit hole to look for another way to look for water. And it turned out that six microns has a unique spectral fingerprint that is specifically for water. And so we went and started looking at instruments that could potentially make these kinds of observations. Uh, we found that no spacecraft currently or in the past had the ability to measure the moon at six microns. And from the ground, the Earth's atmosphere does not transmit any signal. We thought about doing instruments on balloons, but the balloons took some time because we would have to build the instrument to look at uh, the moon in search for water. And then we figured out that Sophia had an instrument that was capable of doing this. And so we ended up proposing and we were awarded some director's discretionary time to test this observation. And it turns out to be pretty great. Great, thank you. Um, so this question um, should probably go to Casey and maybe Sarah can follow up. Um, this is from Dina. How can water exist on the moon without an atmosphere to protect it? That's a great question. So I mentioned briefly that we believe the water is being stored with inside these micrometeorite impact glasses. And these would shelter the water from being lost to space or migrating to the lunar poles. And this would mean that without a lunar atmosphere, the water could stay on the surface of the moon. Sarah, would you like to expand on that? Yeah, that's basically the deal, right? Once once you, you create these little glass beads in a very sort of hot, violent way, right, that melts the glass, uh, and then the water gets trapped in there, and there's just no way to get it, to get it back out again. You can't, it's locked in, and so uh, it is able to withstand the harsh conditions there at the moon. Thank you. Uh, this question is to Paul. Um, how does the discovery of water on the sunlit surface of the moon 
affect the focus of future NASA missions with respect to further probing the observation of more distant objects and planets, such as meteoroids and asteroids along with Mars? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm going to answer it by saying I don't think it's going to change it at all because we've been focused on looking for water all over the solar system for quite a while. Our Mars strategy, how do we pick where our rovers and landers go on Mars, is driven a lot by where do we see evidence of past water on Mars. We want to go and look for uh, how that water has affected Mars and whether there's any evidence of past life on Mars. That's exactly what the uh, Perseverance rover will do on its way to Mars right now. We've also uh, orbited the Ceres asteroid and looked for water on its surface. We're building a satellite called the Europa Clipper, which will be orbiting Jupiter and studying the moon Europa, which is known to have a subsurface ocean uh, uh, on Jupiter, uh, which sometimes breaks through to the surface. So we'll be studying the surface as well as the interior of Europa. Uh, we're sending a quadrocopter out to uh, um, Saturn's moon Titan, which has a uh, system, a hydrology system that's based on methane instead of water. And so looking for water all over the solar system is something we've been doing for quite a while. And uh, we've learned that the moon fits right into that strategy. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go jump back to the phone lines. Uh, let's talk to Chelsea Gold from space.com. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. This is Chelsea Goat of space.com. Um, I know we co we've covered this a little bit already, but I I'm curious what data do scientists still need, whether it's collected with SOFIA or other instruments, to give us a better idea of how we might collect and study water on the moon in person with rovers or crewed missions, and how difficult that collection might be, because it, it seems, at least at this point, that it's going to be fairly difficult. So I think that we have gotten a lot of great data from various remote sensing techniques, but I, I think that the next steps to, to sort of really get at the, the big questions that we need answers to um, is to get down to the surface. Uh, with the, these clip landers we've been talking about with Viper and then, of course, with, with humans, uh, that allows us to sort of see things at the, at the centimeter and decimeter scale where we can really get down and, and understand the distribution and location and, and the types of, of volatiles that, that we expect to be present there. And so I think that's sort of the next big evolution in, in our understanding of water. It's really going to require us to get down to the surface. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and I can add to that real quick, too, on top of what Sarah just said. You know, from an understanding how we access it, in addition to understanding the background of the water, the geochemistry of the water, we we'll also need to understand whether or not it's affecting the geotechnical properties of the regolith it's mixed with. You know, is that surface harder? Uh, is it more friable? And, and it, you know, how does that affect wheels or how does it affect drills? Uh, so understanding physically what we're dealing with, that's going to be a critical piece of data. And, and just as Sarah said, you know, it really does require coupling these broad contextual observations from SOFIA, uh, other orbital assets with uh, measurements right there on the surface. That, that will really help pull this together for us. Great, thank you. Next, we have Ken Kramer from Space Up Close. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, for Casey, uh, I'd like to know, can you talk a little bit more about, in detail, about your observations, follow-up observations of the moon, and, and when you will do them? I'd also like to know uh, if this will be useful at other celestial bodies, like near-Earth asteroids, like, like Bennu. Would you be able to get any useful uh, observations out of that? Thank you. Yeah, so we have actually been granted two hours of observing time in the current cycle, observing cycle for SOFIA. We expect to be doing observing in the spring of 2021, uh, but those have yet to be scheduled. We have also proposed to SOFIA for an additional 72 hours to observe the moon. We would like to map the entire near side and also look at these volcanic features and um, central peaks that we think might be concentrating water. Uh, we have yet to hear back on if we have been granted that time, but we are crossing our fingers. Uh, we have also proposed to look at asteroids 
to look for the six micron water feature. We've requested over six hours to do that as well. So this uh, Sophia can definitely be used to look for water on other airless bodies. Great, thank you. I hope you get the time. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Christopher from Sky News Canada again. Chris? Yes, thank you. Um, the Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I always want to check. Uh, the previous question actually anticipates, uh, and your answer, Casey, um, anticipates my question, which is, um, I'm fascinated that you said you wanted to map the entire near side and look at volcanic features on central peaks that might be concentrating water. So is there is there a suggestion in, in that statement that uh, another mechanism for this water to be uh, present uh, at sunlit surfaces could be tectonic activity that's leading to outgassing? Uh, it's likely not tectonic, but uh, extinct volcanism that happened uh, billions and millions of years ago. So what we ex what we think might have happened is if the moon had water prior while it was forming or it had been delivered early on in the history of the moon, then it could have erupted the internal water onto the surface. And so we want to kind of see by looking at these volcanic features if that's true. Okay, so you think it, so you're looking at sort of primordial volcanism, not necessarily contemporary or relatively recent outgassing. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Jim Siegel from NASA Tech. Oh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I'd like to uh, kind of uh, hop on the back of Ken Kramer's question. Uh, it sounded to me as though, uh, even though you have other ways of of uh, examining and evaluating how much water is on the moon and where it is and so on with Sophie and with the moon rover and so on, uh, it, it sounded to me like uh, there aren't any lakes or puddles of water. So I suspect that the initial uh, Artemis flights are going to have to take their own water. And uh, so that begs the question, well, um, if, if, if and when they do figure out how to mine the water from the moon surface, would you estimate a, roughly how long it might take to really get that underway so that people don't, the astronauts don't have to bring their own water? For example, it's going to be 2026 or 2028, or would you hazard a guess about that? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, you know, again, it, it's hard to say a timeline for that because right at the moment, we don't actually know which type of water we're going after, what the source of that water might be. Uh, you know, we have to figure out if we're going to have a, a technology that's going into some of these cold places or are we going to be developing the technology maybe that can extract the type of water that Sophia is observing. Uh, again, we have a, you know, a cadence of, of payloads and missions coming up, especially working with the Science Mission Directorate and, and CLIPS uh, to collect a lot of that information that will really help us narrow down uh, what choices and pathways we need to take. Um, you're absolutely correct. Uh, Artemis uh, crewed missions will begin by bringing the water that they need um, and will we'll use that water. Uh, but one of the goals will be to continue to collect data that helps us understand uh, what technology lines we need to follow to maybe one day be able to use the water that's there. In addition to that, you can also think about uh, technologies that focus on recycling the water that you do have on the lunar surface. So, um, you know, there's a number of ways for us to think about how to use the resources at the moon, take advantage of the resources we've already brought to the surface of the moon. Um, and, and, you know, we're again, we're I can't stress enough that we're really in the data collection phase right now uh, to make informed decisions about the pathways that we want to follow for that. OK, thank you. And that's all the time we have for today's media telecon. I'd like to thank the panelists and our operator for their time today. I'd like to ask panelists to stay on the line for a few minutes for post follow up. If you joined this telecon late, you can listen to the recording again by dialing 203-369-3652. That number is 203-369-3652. Please join us for a Reddit Ask Me Anything tomorrow. 
at 1 p.m. Eastern Time on the subreddit space. Continue the conversation and keep this, the questions coming at Ask NASA. Thanks and have a great day. This does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect at this time. Speakers, please stand by. <laughs>